morning, church. Good morning, church. Welcome. Good to see you all here today. So, we're going to, and welcome to those who are online. So, we're going to start our service um, with, with a word of prayer, and then we will get started with our worship. All right, so, Lord, thank you for bringing us all here today. Thank you for uh, safe travels um, for everybody that is coming here. Um, ask, Lord, that you will just watch over the service and that you will. God over us, protect us, and allow us to learn what it is that you want us to take away from the sermon that we hear today. Amen.
Good morning, church. How's that, Peggy? Is that good? <laughs> Can you hear me now? All right, great. Thank you. Yeah, some else to that, too. Yeah, it was the only clean one I had today. All right, so we've got a couple of announcements for you. And it looks like the TV's off here, so it's going to be interesting. All right, so offering envelopes will be in next week. Well, actually, no, I think they're already in. So if you've not gotten your offering envelopes, they are outside on the table in the fellowship hall. Is that right? Yeah, so if you haven't gotten it yet, it's probably out there. So just look for your name, and you can pick it up. Next, we are still collecting your Christmas cards, right, until what day? What's the last no, day? No, the Christmas cards, you've got to get your Christmas cards. We promised to put your names up if you didn't get them yet. Gotcha. Because uh, we didn't do that, so we were nice to you. So this week, Ron Kilm, you've got the cards right there. Ron's got the cards right that way up in front. Make sure you take your cards with you, or we will have to throw them out or give them to you next year. <laughs> yep. All right, next. All right, so if you would like to help undergrade the church, there are still lights around the building that need help. Uh, taken down, so if you have time, would like to help out, talk to Pastor Gary. Next. All right, Snow Glow Retreat. That is coming up in just a couple weeks. That is the winter retreat for the youth group here, coming up on the 20th to the 22nd. So I know there's still kids that want to go. Um, so we are still looking for donations for, um, what's the thing called? Yeah, for scholarships. Thank you. So yeah, scholarships. So if you'd like to help out with that, um, go talk to Zach. And then I think last we have our prayer updates, which I got a few here. So let me just pull out my handy dandy cell phone because I am very forgetful. All right. That, didn't, that wasn't the right password. There we go. Okay, so um, as most of you might have heard, um, Ken Brothers, his father passed away suddenly. So please be praying for the Brothers family there with the sudden passing of please Ken Sr. But yeah, Ken Brothers, his father. Um, Lillian... Uh, Piscopo having an operation on Monday, so please be praying for her. Um, Ma- uh, Lillian Piscopo? P- P- Piscopo. Yeah. I'm terrible at pronouncing the last name, so I apologize. But yes, her. Please be praying for her having an operation on Monday. Uh, Mary Fallon is also having an operation on Friday, so please be praying for that as well. Then Victoria Davidson, um, her and her husband take care of uh, George. Um, her husband has been recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It spread to his liver, and he's going through chemo right now, so they're having a uh, you know, difficult time with that. Then they have three small children, so please be praying for the Davidson family there. Okay, so that, we're going to turn back over to the worship team. Let's just have a word of prayer if we can before yeah. we do that. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that's before us. We do remember, uh, ask for... Um, D, Pastor D and uh, Pastor Ken and, and D. Uh, D went back to the hospital last evening and has continued to be in with different problems. We ask for your care over her and watch her especially. We also want to remember the uh, Ken brothers uh, losing his dad suddenly this last week, totally unexpected, and um, here one minute and two hours later gone to heaven. We just ask for them as they uh, prepare for some sort of a remembrance, uh, private remembrance, as there will be no funeral, and we as for a blessing over um, he and Crystal and the family, and his mom especially, as she deals with the loss of her husband. And then for Lillian, we've seen her. She's been in the hospital since Christmas Day, and now we finally think they can repair something that's been wrong for a long time in her throat. And she's willing to take that risk, and we ask that as she goes under the, the uh, surgery on Tuesday that you'll be with her and give the uh, doctors especially the ability to be able to handle um, her particular situation. For this all and all those un- uh, unmentioned prayer requests because we all have those in our heart. We just thank you for listening to us this day. We ask for your blessing over the uh, future of the service for the next song and the final song and the, and the message from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Oh, if please you're stand, everybody. <coughs> We're going to do this. Praise out of nine.
Not all very talkative this morning, huh? <laughs> Been a long, a, a long start to the new year. <laughs> very good. Guess where we're back to? James. Yes, we're going to finish up James. So, um, finished our Christmas season, finished uh, New Year's Day. Um, anybody have trouble getting on church on time today and figure out what time the service was? Anybody? Um, I saw my clock, I thought it all set, you know, and already, but, you know, I realized that instead of 6.45 to come, I set it for 7.15, and I, I don't know, for some reason, I was off for an hour, you know, also I'm thinking, wow, I'm going to miss worship practice, I don't speed it up here, so, uh, at any rate, but uh, it's a, we're back to our normal schedule now, and so folks online, if you're uh, seeing us, you may, uh, uh, you know, go back to our 9 and 11 services, which we will um, live stream, and then uh, save one of them for the... Uh, for the future for uh, you to be able to look up. We're going to be in James today, and um, this is kind of a, a touchy sermon to preach, you know. I didn't, uh, I got assigned, well, I got assigned, you know, this kind of thing as we go through the difference. I just happened to want it. I'm not sure why this, uh, I have everything turned off, but let's try this. Let's take another look here and see what we've got. Just one second, turn off your cell phones if you got them or put them on silent, which is what evidently something happened here and it didn't go well there. But um, it's tough because it's, uh, it's talking about church conflict. Does anybody like talking about conflict? Okay. How many people have been in conflict with somebody for the, in, at some point in time uh, over the last two months? Raise your hands if you have a conflict or a crossword or an argument or something with somebody over the last two months. Okay. I'm going to sit down because I have, and I'm going to let some of you folks that didn't raise your hands come up here and tell me how to do it. It seems like you've lived two months conflict-free. You didn't have an anger word against anybody. You didn't have any hurt feelings. You didn't have anybody that said something that irked you, and you didn't get back. I mean, 
that's incredible. You folks that didn't raise your hands, I just, I, you know, I worship you as far as uh, your, your, your ability to do that, you know. Typically, if you're a human, you're going to have somebody that's going to disagree with you or have a problem with you, right? Yep, and, yep, and you're pointing to your spouse, and that's true. <laughs> Oftentimes, your spouse. So if you're married, I know you're lying. <laughs> Not just you, all of us, myself included, you know, because you always have those, those things that get misunderstood or someone says something or, oh, well, your, your tone was wrong. I mean, something happens. So today we're going to be talking about conflict because James is talking to the churches at large, and he says, you know, churches of conflict. And I guess it's somewhat of a concern that to me that the same kind of conflicts they had, you know, 2,000 years ago, they're still having. But I guess it's a little bit of an encouragement to say we're not unusual when we have conflicts because it's been going on for 2,000 years and James has been trying to tell us how to handle it. So today we'll look at what type of conflicts there are, and then next week we'll be looking at um, verses 7 and on how to handle some of the conflicts. So if you go to the next slide, some of you remember the, um, the story of the elephant and the blind men. Anybody hear this, the story of the elephant and the blind men? There was, a, there was a, um, a, a colony of blind men that were living together, and they got an announcement that an extraordinary animal was coming to this town, and uh, they all turned out to see this extraordinary animal. And the owner of the animal stopped it in the city square, and each of the blind went up and felt it. So one man went up and felt it, and he felt the, the tusk, and he says, oh, it's a spear! And another one went down, and he, he uh, tried the trunk, and, he, and the end of the trunk said, oh, it's a snake. You know, it's like a snake. And another man's on the, up, up on the top, and he's feeling, feeling the ears, and he says, oh, it's like a fan. You know, and then, then the other one's on the tail, and they, he gets the tail, and he says, oh, it's, it's like a rope. And the guy on the side of it said, no, it's like a, a barn, like a side of a house, you know. I mean, and these, these blind men started arguing with each other. Because about what this was like because they all had a different perspective of this same animal. And they, and they couldn't agree and they got mad at each other. And, uh, you know how the story might go, you know. Which one of them was wrong? None of them. They were all right from their perspective. They all had 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 a little piece of the animal they had done. And, you know, the guy that grabbed the leg and thought it's a tree, you know, I mean, yeah, to him it felt like a tree. But he wasn't feeling the rest of it because he was blind. He couldn't see the other person's perspective. And so many times this happens. Oh, I mean, I've been here 33 years. I've been in my last church before that five years. And I can't tell you the number of conflicts that have come up because of people having problems. They've had to mitigate between two people or had one of the elders have to mitigate between two people. It just happens. It happens all the time. And we, James is kind of saying, you've got to look at why you do this, you know. And then you got to look how to get out of it. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this particular section today and look at this, um, and we're going to read the text first, and then after we read the text, we're going to break it down. There's four things that can cause us to have conflict in the church, and James talks about the four things. Actually, James talks about stuff. I didn't think of four things. James talks about four areas that I've broken it down to, and I'm going to show you what those four areas are according to my perception as we look at the scripture. So let's go to the next uh, slide, if you will, and let's all stand as we read God's word together, okay? So read it with me, if you will, starting at verse 1. There's six verses, so we'll have another slide to go yet. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that war, in, which war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you folks may be seated at this point. So let's take a look at this passage and see how we, how we break this down. Uh, the first thing that uh, I've, I've this, I think in this passage it talks about in the first verses is we suffer 
from wrong actions. That's conflict. Wrong actions, things we do. And uh, there's the, we can have agony, which is not all pain, is gain. Uh, some's just agony. And then there's strife. And I like this, this phrase that's down at the bottom of the slide if you take a look at it. As long as we have each other, we'll never run out of problems. Well, usually you think we, as long as we have each other, you know, we'll be okay and we'll be a seed, we'll encourage each other. But uh, it's also true, as long as we have each other, we'll never run out of problems, you know. If you want to go to the church that has no conflict, start your own with you as the only member, you know. And you'll probably still get mad at yourself. So, I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's just ridiculous, you know. I mean, there's always these things. Somebody says something, somebody does something, and, the, you know, a, a lot of times it's not even intentional, but it happens. And we need to be, we need to realize that. When I came here uh, to this church um, and we started and we had elders, um, there was conflict in my last church too. I mean, there are people with conflict, uh, conflict with me, conflict with others. I just, and I found this book that was terrific. You can't, um, you can't find such regular, regularly online today. Uh, I had to go to eBay to get my other copy, but I have one of the very first copies. It's on hardback still. And let's see, this thing was written back in, where was it? Here, let's see. 1985, 95, 2005, 2015, you know, this was a, it was written a couple of years before I took my church pa first church pastorate, and it was a part of a series, actually, it's called the Leadership Library, and if I'm not mistaken, yes, volume one, of all the books, this Leadership Library, the 15 or 20 topics they could have written about, this was the first one they wrote. And it was called Well-Intentioned Dragons. And I loved the book. And I required it of all my elders who, who, who became an elder to read it. And then for those that were training as elders, we had that Men's Leadership Life Group, which I want to start up again. Um, but uh, when the, some of the guys were on that, uh, the two Shawns and, and Mike Phillips, I had them read this. And I remember one of the guys said, boy, that was a great book. And he's like, you know what? One of these sounds like a person I could be. I, I got to make sure I avoid that, you know? Well-intentioned dragons. They're, they're not people that, uh, no, some are. Some are people that are just trying to give you problems, let's face it. But some of them are well-intentioned people, but they're just, they're dragons in the church. You know, they, they pick up problems, or they say things, or they, or they undermine things, and some of them look really spiritual. You know, my last church was a guy that was, looked at highly spiritual. I mean, after the fiasco that took place at that church, and uh, one, of the, one of the, and we had deacons back then, one says, we will never let that happen again. We will never let him have that influence. They finally, after all these years, realized the, the way he was a well-intentioned dragon and dragging people down. And then this, uh, this uh, book finally went out of print, and I couldn't get it anymore, except that under eBay, thank you, Josh, I do need that this morning. Um, I couldn't get it, so I looked for another one, and here I, I found this book, Antagonist in the Church, okay? Antagonist in the Church, there they are. And how to identify and deal with destructive conflict. So all this to say, this is not something that's new to the church, and, you know, if somebody says something that disturbs you, don't leave the church. I mean, that's not the wrong, res that's the wrong response, as we'll find in James today. Don't get mad and up and go someplace else. Uh, you know, if you, if you have a problem and you don't fix it, you know what's going to happen? You could take it with you to the next church, you know? And you, just, you go from church to church and you just continue to have problems, you know? You got to fix it. If you, if you said something that offended somebody, apologize as best you can, you know? And sometimes they won't accept it, you know, and that makes it really tough when a person won't accept what, you know, and you, and you really try, I may, uh, but, uh, you know, you've got to do your part. And sometimes, I, I know one time, I apologized for something that I really didn't do. I, I wasn't the guilty party, but I thought, well, let me apologize, you know, and um, when I went to apologize because that person had offended, did something really dramatic, offended both me and, and it was my father's church. Um, they didn't even remember the incident. And this was five years later. I, I dealt with it for five years because I was out of town, came back and moved back from Oregon, from seminary, talked to them about it, didn't even remember it. But it made a significant thing to the point, to the point that my father was ready to send me as a, as a high schooler to a different church. That's how severe it was. Didn't even remember it. So, uh, you know, we need to be able to, um, sometimes uh, we apologize for things we didn't do, or, or apologize for misunderstandings, but, you know, conflict is there. So if you think you're in the perfect church here and the pastor will never say anything that you don't like or someone else in the church will never say anything you don't like or won't act some way or say, uh, you know, you're in the wrong place, uh, you know? I mean, because we're all flawed. 
and we all have problems, and we all have people that don't understand us sometimes. So that latest background, all that is just fluff, you know, from personal experience, you know. You, you get on a topic, and I just, you know, to share your heart on what things go along, it, it hurts. It hurts when people uh, get mad at you, and then they won't resolve the conflict. They won't, they won't uh, let you apologize. They won't uh, let, you, let it be fixed sometimes, and that becomes a, a, an issue and a difficulty. I like what John DeBryan said. John DeBryan is with the Lord now. He had used to have a program called Song Time, and uh, he used to say this, uh, oh, there it is, I put it up there. What we need in the American church today is a good dose of persecution. He said that back when I was in high school working at Sandy Cove Bible Conference, I heard him down there. And uh, it makes sense, you know? I mean, how many of our problems of people arguing about, you know, uh, you offended me, or you said something that was wrong, or I don't like the color of the carpet, or, you know, you changed the name of the church, I mean, whatever it is. There's all kinds of things that people get upset about, you know? But how much would that matter if we were living in China, for instance, right now, with the, with the possibility that the government or North Korea and the government could come and arrest any one of us and put us in jail for the next 30 years for violating the um, communist uh, principles they had, you know? Would you be as concerned about what somebody else said to hurt your feelings when maybe your pastor was in prison for the last five years? And they showed up, and, there, and there's pictures of this. You can go look at it in China, where they, they've, they've gone in, they've, uh, and they've bulldozed the church. This church isn't a registered church. And there's a church like this, 100 years old, just coming and bulldoze the whole thing down to a, to a... That's what happens in other places sometimes. And yet we sit here with our petty arguments, and, you know, you didn't cross that T or dot this I right, you know, and we get mad and upset about it. And so I think he's right. You know, if we were in a place where, you know, our very lives were being threatened because we were believers, we would have a little bit more tolerance towards other people, wouldn't we? And we need to consider that. So um, we can't ignore it. I mean, even our church history, our own church history, there was a problem. I mean, um, you don't like to say it, you don't like to talk about the past, but as a pastor I've reached out to and talked to and, and apologized for us. Uh, I, as, as I understand the story, he went to Florida for two weeks and came back and they took a vote and threw him out of the church, you know. I uh, know this is years and years ago. The guy's in his late 80s now, you know. But churches do this kind of thing. We shoot our own and we shouldn't do that, you know. We, we, we have the, the world as our enemy, you know. Satan is our enemy, not each other, you know. We don't shoot each other, but yet we oftentimes do. Often we bring troubles on ourselves through a couple of different, sometimes petty idiosyncrasies, you know. I like this. Oh, the big one, music, right? You know, I know people have left the church because, oh, you started using those new things or, you know, we haven't put these back where they were, but oh, you got a drum set on the on the on the on the stage. We can't have a drum. Well, that's fine. If you don't like that, you can find another church that that, that, that believes the same way. I'm not saying that in sarcastic. I'm just saying, you know, there are churches that maybe feel that way. Maybe you feel like you know the only version of the Bible you can use the King James is a version. There's a Baptist church here that only uses ever the King James Bible. But you know, we need to be as flexible as we can with each other. And it's our own idiosyncrasy sometimes which create these problems because they did something I didn't like or really what I didn't like was really nothing much. Nobody else would have picked it out. Sometimes it's a desire to get our own way. You know, I want my way, you know. Remember kids, when we were kids, ever say, can you do that? My grandson stopped once. I picked him up, stood him on the bed, eye to eye, and I said, you do not stomp in grandfather's house, <laughs> you know. I don't think he ever has. <laughs> it says, you know, but you know, I want my way. Boom, and we put our foot down. That's childish, but still, we as adults do it sometimes, don't we? And we do it in the church. It's it's stupidity, really. Um, personality conflicts. You know, uh, I I was not a real big one on personality. I did a little bit of uh, uh, research on it for a while. You got the MDM. Um, you got got the. Um, uh, Myers Briggs, which has like 16 personalities. That's too complicated for me. I can't even figure out the four personality types. But I really got, I've, I've studied those. And in fact, as elders, when we're doing elders and training, we, there's a book out called the, uh, um, it, it was for DISC. Uh, I don't know. Anybody ever heard of the DISC personality test? Okay. Um, they're all somewhat similar. Um, Tom uh, LaHaye used to write books called Transformed Temperaments. Um, and I forget what the other one was, but uh, you've seen Gary Smalley does it. They'll, they'll have four different personality types. 
Um, and when they talk about animals, you know, one's the, one's the otter, of, you know, because he just loves it. That's the, that's the I, you know. So DISC basically has D-I-S-C. There's four different personality types they've come up with, okay? When you do it in, in, um, in uh, Gary Smalley's way, I think it was, you know, he, he associates each one with an animal because he thinks there's the dog, the laboratory retriever, the, you know, there's the otter because you relate to each one a little differently. Uh, another way that someone did it was, um, um, and LeHay did this in his, um, one of those books, Transport Temperaments, I forget the other one now, uh, but he, he related each one to a person in the Bible. You know, this personality was like Moses, this personality was like Paul, this personality was like Abraham, you know, and he had four different people. And uh, I, on the disc, I'm usually a high D, and also second, my second is C. Um, I try to do, I try to get towards the I, because the I is the interpersonal relationships, and you try to make that a higher, and, and got high on that once, but, you know, D is the visionary kind of thing, so each one of these personality types has a, has a way to go. And then it, uh, in the book, uh, one of the books, The Elder Studies, when we look at it, each, each personality type interacts in different ways, you know, so basically the D and the C don't like each other. The D is the visionary, you know. The C is, I don't know if the C stands for, complementary or whatever. Obviously not in my notes in the real study, but it was like, they're the, they're the engineers, the accountants, you know, the thing. Like, the visionary says, let's go out and, and buy this nativity set for the church. And the C, the C says, you know, you can't buy that. It cost $184.55, so we only have $184 left in the budget you can't pen the extra 55 cents. That's the C, you know? So the D and C, you know, the D hates the C. Well, it doesn't say hate, but you have to get along. That's what I say, different personality. The, D, the C is the rule, the rule follower, and the D is not the rule breaker, but the, but the visionary. And if the rules stop our vision, let's change the rules, you know? The C says you can't change the rules. So you've got different personality types. You can go through all these, and it's very interesting to study and look at. But sometimes the problem is a difference in um, just personalities. And that's why I say I'm always arguing with myself because I'm a DC. So I want to follow the rules. That's why you and you rarely, I think, find a pastor who's good in C, um, which is, you know, the accounting, the budgets, and gets all that stuff straight. Usually the visionaries, and they, they're not good at administration. Administration happens to be one of my gifts, so I'm good at the C stuff. But I'm also good at the D stuff, you know. So uh, having both of those is kind of unusual. So I say, well... I argue with myself about the rules, but then I decide whether I'm going to break the rule, but is the rule allowed to be broken? And then uh, the paralysis of analysis comes in, you know? You analyze things so much that you, you don't make a decision. At some point, you've got to pull the trigger, right? And make a decision. Anyway, all that personality types. All that to say that as we look at conflict in the church, sometimes it's a matter of a personality. And we've got to, and, and looking at some of these books that talk about different personality types and saying, you know what? I'm a D, or I'm an, I'm an S. My wife's an S. Steady. You know, just always there, plotting, always will do the job, not the, the, the supervisionary, but not the, it's just the, you know, that's the dependable person. You can depend on them being there, you know, and, and following through on stuff. Uh, so these personality types help, but if you find out what your personality type is and you find out what your spiritual gift is, you can go on our website and select spiritual gifts, find out what your spiritual gift is. That tells you how God's wired you in order to be able to be used in the church. And the same thing happens. That's why Corinthians got in such a, a mess because people have different spiritual gifts. And, you know, the person that had the gift of help said, I want the gift of, you know, prophecy because I want to stand up there and, you know, make a big deal about myself. And, uh, and the person with the gift of helps just doesn't do that. They, they typically want to sit back there and, you know, you ask them to do something, they'll get it done. Uh, and I'll, show, I'll give you a quick illustration. Again, none of this is in my notes. So the, the, next, the rest of the notes will take another three hours to go through. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, let me give you two examples. The gift of exhortation and the gift of mercy, okay? See, the person with the gift of mercy who just, I mean, they're the one you can talk to. And, and in fact, I just had, a, just had an occurrence out there in the back. And uh, they wanted a person with the gift of mercy. Just listen to me, you know? Listen to me. T let me tell you. And... I don't want anything else from you. I just want you to listen. And the person goes, oh, I'm so sorry with where you're at. You know, I'm so, and, I, and they're the empathetic one, you know, and they're a gift of mercy. The person with the gift of exhortation says, you know, um, the scriptures say this is what you ought to do. Well, that person is also important because the person with the gift of mercy just listens and the person doesn't get any scriptural background or any exhortation as to how to get out of it. They're in a, so the person with the gift of exhortation says to the gift of person, all you do is listen to them. Tell them something to do so to help them. And the person who gets the mercy says, they don't need to hear your stuff right now. They just need a listening ear, you know. So these two personality types could get in conflict. 
But they're both needed. They're both needed. Each one of us is needed. So when, else, so when someone else with in the, have a personality conflict with somebody, recognize that this may, you may not appreciate them right now, but someday you will be in the need of where they're at, and their personality type will be something that can really help you out. And that, you know, sometimes conflicts come from that. And then the fourth one is wrong assumptions or misunderstandings. People make, a misunderstand, make an assumption about something, and um, it's a false assumption. It's a wrong assumption. But in their mind, they're right, you know. And they're going to they're gonna pursue that down the road, you know. And it winds up being a misunderstanding. Something you said, we've talked about before, the communication. You know, it goes through the, you say this, it goes through your filter of what you think you wanted to say and what really got said, what they think they want to hear, and then what they actually hear, you know. And then by the time it gets back to you again, it's a whole different thing. It's the idea of the, the 15 people sitting around the circle and telling a person there and then goes back. And by the time you get to the 15th person, a lot of times it's different than what the first person said because we have those filters and it's just a misunderstanding, you know. We need to work those things out, you know. And so in the scriptures when it says here in verse 1, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? Sometimes that's it. Sometimes we just, we, the source of conflict is that we don't understand each other. There was a Sunday school teacher who just finished teaching a lesson to the boys about uh, how to resolve conflict and what the Bible says from James about, you know, being nice to each other and trying to understand. And so they said, okay, now, after I said, what, um, tell me somebody, what did I just say? How do you resolve conflict? And one of the boys raised his hand and he said, what is it? Shoot him. <laughs> no, that's not what I told you, you know. But that's the way some people decide they're going to, you know, handle conflict, you know. Just bang, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in your face about it. Um, there was this old legend, and I'll read this one, uh, this illustration. This old legend that tells of Hercules encountering a strange animal on a narrow road. He struck it with his club and passed on. Soon the animal overtook him, now three times as large as before. Hercules struck it again, fast and furiously. But the more he clubbed the beast, the larger it grew. Then Pallas appeared to Hercules and warmed him to stop. The monster's name is Strife. She said, let it alone, and it will soon become as little as it was in the beginning. We just bang Strife, we just hit it, and we just keep on hitting that conflict, and it just keeps on going nowhere. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 says, If therefore you're presenting your offering at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. There's a story of two brothers who got into conflict. And, and I could see this happening easily. None of my family, I don't have a brother, or my sister's gone now, but you know, I've, I've dealt with enough families I can see this happening. Two brothers got into conflict with each other. And who was hurt the most? Mom. She hates to see her two brothers, two boys not being able to walk. So the one boy knew that it really bothered her. And he bought her an expensive gift, a nice, just exactly what she would want, and gave it to her. And she said, that's not what I want. The greatest gift you, you could give me is to make peace with your brother. And isn't that true? You know, giving gifts to kind of smooth it over doesn't handle it. But if we can, if we can make peace and forgive each other and move on, that's the greatest way to do it. We get riled up, we make rash decisions, and we do things that hurt other people or hurt the church. That's what results when we don't do this. Next slide, if you will. Um, we were doing the church covenant. I didn't even think about this, but I was reading the church covenant. We read it last week with our, as we did uh, um, our uh, communion, and I, this one just popped out of me as I saw this particular section coming up. We further engage. This is one of our church covenants as we promise, as we sign, and we become a member. That's why I say it's good to become a member. You know, you're making a covenant with each other, and you need to follow it. And part of this covenant says we further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer. If you pray for each other, you're probably not going to have as big of a conflict. To be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. If you're a member of this church, you subscribe to this church covenant. This is part of what you subscribe to. And we need to do this. We need to follow through that. That's what James is saying. So the first thing that we have is we suffer from wrong actions. 
The second thing we sometimes suffer from is wrong attractions. And that's what he says in this verse I just wrote, read where he said, um, he talked about um, pleasure. Let's read on from verse 2. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. And you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So let's just break this down with the wrong attractions. Um, the source of conflict sometimes is the desire for pleasure. You know, we want to have um, good things. And so consequently, um, our desire for pleasure is uh, when we say, well, um, I, you know, uh, that person doesn't need this as much as I, so I'm going to steal it from them, you know. Or, uh, boy, just, just look at the riots. The riots we've had across the United States, the looting, people going in, you know, pleasure. I want this. Now, hopefully none of them, none of them are believers in Christ, you know. But that's it, you know. I want, I want, I want, you know. And so here's my chance. There's been a hurricane or there's a lot of confusion. I'm going to go in and grab what I want, pleasure. And that brings conflict because you've taken it from somebody else and now they're upset with you. Pleasure. Pleasure comes, turns into greed. Um, this, story talk, uh, this is a story told of Abraham Lincoln who had so many wise things to, to say, but he said he's walking down his, the street one day and a, a man saw him walking down the street with his two boys in tow and they were crying and all angry and all mad and everything else. And he said to Lincoln, he said, what's the problem with your sons? He said, the same thing that's a problem with the entire world. I've got three walnuts, and each boy wants two. Isn't that it? You know? We won. We won. That's the problem. The result of pleasure sometimes is murder. And that comes, isn't it? You know? Especially, if we, you see it on, on sometimes on the, on the news, you know, somebody wants someone else's spouse, you know, and so they wind up getting rid of the one spouse so they can be with the other spouse. I mean, that's the extreme. But um, when he talks about murder, he's not necessarily talking about physical murder all the time. In Matthew 5, 21 and 22, it says, You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. It's part of the Ten Commandments. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, calls another person a fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So, I mean, Jesus Christ didn't pull any punches, did he? You know? When he talks about murder, he says, everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Uh, if, you've got, if you're angry with your brother for something, you need to, uh, you need to make it right. You know, even if they're unreasonable. Even if they don't agree with you, try. And if you've done your part and they won't respond, that's their problem, not yours. But you need to reach out. The third thing is the reason we don't have is because we don't ask. So the it's the result of the, for pleasure. And then the reason you don't have is your desires. Uh, you don't have your desires is, one, you don't ask. Okay? In verse 2 it says, um, you, um, you do not have because you do not ask. Um, what a friend we have in Jesus is a song that many of you know. Here's what one of the verses says. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. That's ask. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. That kind of relates to the ask not, right? You know, we don't talk to God. We don't ask the right things. We don't take it to him in prayer. And consequently, we wind up doing exactly what, what a friend says. We wind up forfeiting our peace and having needless pain in, in, in our lives. The second reason we don't have ask is verse 3. It says, you ask and do not have or do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Now, if you look back to James 1, 14 and 15, he talked about this a little bit. James 1, 14 and 15, if we just go back a couple pages in your Bible, I hope you have your Bible open. It says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. That when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So this is not the first time he's mentioned this co concept. It's just, it's, he, he repeats it again because it's so important. We ask with wrong motives. Why are we asking? Why do you want that new car? Why do you want the new house? Why are you jealous of someone else in the church because they got a job that you didn't want? I've, I don't think I've ever had a person be jealous of someone because they got a job. <laughs> Most people are jealous maybe because they 
got to sit in the pew and never had a job, and they're doing all the things. I'm doing all the work. They're a Martha. You know, I'm doing all the work right here. How come you don't join the church and become part and, and take something on? You know, I don't know. But at um, any rate, uh, we, the, the, the problem is we ask for wrong motives. We, we look at things, and, you know, when we ask for something, well, we want a trip or we want to purchase. And, we, and why is it? It's for us to make me happy. When's the last time you asked for God to give you, let's say, um, let's say you need a car. Please, Lord, give me a car because I, wanted, I, I know some folks that aren't going to church and I'd like to be able to transport them to church in my car, you know? Or let me have uh, a spare room in my house. And, of course, it depends. Sometimes you have children, you can't do kind of things. But Zach's a, Zach and Rebecca are a, a, an example of this, you know? They brought Zach here in and he's been staying with them and living with them. They consider him his son, you know? I mean, they had a spare bedroom and they're using it, you know? But when's the last time we said, well, give us a house big enough to be able to help somebody else out? Or give us enough money so I can help someone, you know, give a gift to somebody. You know, not to put it in my, my bank account and be able to invest it and get more money. But how can I help others with it? Sometimes in the, in the man in the street interviews when they say, you know, if you had X number of dollars, what would you do with it? You know, and they get all kinds of answers, you know. Go out and buy a new car, buy a house, buy a, you know, buy a ring, buy, you know. Some people, some people do occasionally say, I'd want to, I'd give it to a charity. And that'd be great if we can do that. But why do we want things? Consider the Israelites in Psalm 106, 13 to 15. If you want to, if you want to write that down or read it, it says this. They quickly forgot God's works. They did not wait for his counsel, but craved intensely in the wilderness. You remember they just come out of Egypt, and they were craving what they had in the wilderness. In the, in the wilderness, they didn't have a whole lot of stuff. They were craving what they had in Egypt. And they tempted God in the desert. So he gave them a request. He gave them food. He gave them manna and so forth. But he sent wasting disease among them. They got what they wanted, but it wasn't really what they wanted. It brought them nothing but grief. Uh, you, have, you see this all the time in the, in the, uh, in the uh, news. Somebody gets, wins the lottery, right? Oh, I got a million dollars. It destroys them, you know? All their friends want a piece of it, and unless you give them a piece of it, they're going to be mad at you. All your relatives think you should pay off their house and their car and everything else and make them rich, and so they get mad at you. And pretty soon you say, well, I should do something myself. And you go out and, and, and buy a lot of exotic stuff, and then you're down to nothing. Then you don't have money to pay the taxes on it. Then you go to the tax court. I just, it just snowballs. You get what you want. You, buy, you get the lottery, but it becomes poison to you. On the other hand, listen to this verse from Psalm 37.4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also so to him, trust also in him, and he will do it. A few other verses I'll throw out. Um, Matthew 6.33, if you're writing down verses, Matthew 6.33, one you should know, should have memorized. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Don't seek the things you want added to you, seek the kingdom of God first. 1 John 5.14 and 15, this is the confidence we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will... What he wants us to have, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. So God will give us a request if we ask according to his will. Now, if you ask just for your personal pleasures and other things, you're not going to get it. Philippians 4.19, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. It's interesting. Most people forget the context of that. <laughs> if you look at Philippians 4, it says, it's basically, are you taking care of those that are ministering to you, in Paul's case, was Paul. You know, my God will supply your needs as, as you supply mine as a minister of the gospel. And they, they forget that there's a caveat to that. They think, just God will give me anything I want. No. Take care of the ones who minister to you first, and then I'll supply your needs, you know. A lot of people say, supply my needs first, then I'll give, take care of them. You know, that's what we do, it, right? Give me the first. God says, no, give me the first fruits, you know, the 10%. You say, well, I don't, get, I don't have enough to give them 10%. Well, that's because you're, you're hoarding the 10% and giving it the end. God says, give it the first part, and then I'll supply your needs, you know? But you can't say, well, I'll supply your needs first, and once you have all your needs supplied, then you can give your 10% or whatever it is. Because if you do that, guess what? You don't get to the 10%. How much is enough? How much is enough? Here's the answer. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. So if you're waiting to have enough, 
to give your 10% to the church. If you're waiting to have enough to share with someone else, do it first. Because if you wait to the end, you'll never have it. <laughs> It'll never be there. Third thing, we've got two more to go, and we're, not gonna, and we're gonna go to these pretty fast. We suffer from wrong associations in verse four and five. It says in verse four, you adulteresses. Now, it doesn't mean they're having adulterous relationships, but he's calling them adulterous because they're supposed to be committed to God and to the church, and instead, they're committed to other things in their lives that are pulling them away from God, okay? It's the, it's the verse in Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for if he will hate the one and he'll love the other, or will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So he says, an adulteress, he says, if you're trying to serve money, serve your spouse, serve your, uh, you know, your work, serve, you put other people before me, you're an adulterer. Because you've, you've left me your first love, God, and you're, and you're letting something else take my place. And he says, oh, adulteresses. And it could, be, it could be good times, it could be a building, it could be a bank account, it could be a program, it could be a lot of things. What is first in your life? And then he makes this situation, this, this uh, reference here, if you look in, in, uh, in James itself, the second half of verse 4. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And he can even start before that, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Do you want to seek the approval of the world? Or do you want to seek the approval of God? Because you can't have them both. If you're pleasing God, someone's going to get mad at you, Okay? They're going to say you're a homophobe. They're going to say, you know, you're making me look bad at work because you're doing your job and I'm not. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that people will not like you if you are serving God. And if you're, if you're serving so that they love you, then you're really probably not doing what God wants you to do. God's standards are so different from the world's. A couple of illustrations here. I got to figure out which ones I want to use and which ones I don't want to use. There, I'll use this one. Ermin, there was a, there's a, I think ermine is how you say it. It's, a, it's an animal. And um, it has a pure white coat. In fact, some cases they used to use the, uh, they use the pelts for the inner lines of judges' um, garments because the pure white in the inside demonstrated the, the, um, the uh, judge was pure and his verdicts and clean and didn't have a, 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 a a priority towards one person or the other. This animal is so concerned to keep its coat clean that here's how the trappers get it. They go out and they, they put defecate, you know, defecate the entrance to the Irvine's home or where, when they find it, the place where it goes. And then they send the dogs after the animal. It chases the animal. The animal gets to his house where it's safe but it won't go inside because there's defecation there, and it wants to keep its pure white coat clean. So rather than get its pure white coat dirty, it will stay out and face the dogs and gives up its life. Zodiac, um, uh, uh, Zodiates, which was the one who gives this illustration, says, rather than go into the unclean place, he faces the yelping jaws, dogs and preserves the purity of, of his fur at the price of, of his life. It is better that he surrender his life than be spoiled by uncleanness. Conflict comes from that. Then there's one last one, and we'll hit that quickly. We suffer from wrong attitudes. It's the last day, the wrong attitudes. We got Satan, you know, and it's and and off the sides, it's pride, and he, he talks about that in this section. So do you know? So in verse five and six. Do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us, but he gives us a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the pr proud, but gives grace to the humble. Satan was proud, and God cast him out of heaven because he tried to take God's place. Eve, she was enticed because he said, hey, you can know, be like God and know everything if you eat this fruit. She wanted that. She wanted to be proud of what she knew. She ate of the fruit. Goliath. He sent this dog after me. You know, incredible. And he took a stone to the forehead and died. He was killed. One of the songs, and oh, in time, I'm going to skip this, I guess. Um, I have it up on the piano. I thought about going over and singing it with you. 
but uh, grace, um, he giveth more grace is in our hymnal. Beautiful words as we think of when we get to problems like this and, and places where our wrong attitudes, you remember God can give you the grace to be nice in that situation. It says in the song, and I'll read the words here with you if you will, rather than sing them. He giveth more grace when our burdens grow greater. Can you identify with burdens growing greater? He sendeth more strength as our labors increase. He added, to added afflictions, he addeth his mercy to multiply trials he multiplies peace. His love is no limits. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. There was a rich man who wanted to um, help a family in the church. And so he, but he didn't want them to know where it was coming from. So he gave a, a, a large sum of money to a person in the church that he trusted and said, I would like you to give this, pass this money on to them. I don't know where this was going when I first read it. He said, so he gave $25 to the person. And then he wrote this. More to follow. And then a little while later, he sent him another $25. And said, more to follow. And they sent another $25. More to follow. And he continued this practice until the entire sum was gone. We'll never be able to exhaust God's grace in our lives. He giveth and giveth and giveth again. So if God gives us that grace, why can't we be that graceful with others? That was sure helps stop a lot of conflict. We'll get into some of these next week as we look at this passage in verses 7 and following. But we need to identify the problem. He gives grace to the humble. We come proud and, th and, and pride's a lot of it, you know. I want what I want, so that's why I, you know, am nasty with this. I want what I want, so that's why I'm going to vote this way. Or I'm what I want, that's why I don't like this person. Or what. It's all a matter of uh, sometimes a pride and getting what we want. But the theme this morning is God's grace enhances godly behavior. God's grace enhances godly behavior. May that be the focus of what we say and what we do. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time to be able to uh, focus on your word. It's not easy to preach on conflict because I'm just, seems like, in my position, I get into too much of it. And it seems like you're always trying to please people or trying to stop conflict from coming. Please help us to please God. And please help us to be able to eat our word sometimes when it gets to that point and be able to just um, wind up bringing peace to the situation, knowing that your grace is sufficient to give us more grace than what we need and to be gracious for us in the future. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our last song this morning. Truly need the words of this song to be with us.
salvation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. song in our prayer as we leave this place today. God bless you. Out of here.